Hi and welcome, this is Hayley from Parallel Coaching. Just a quick video uh, to outline the anatomy of the muscle. And this is uh, from request from the learners on course at the moment, whereby we went through this in class and they said it made them understand the anatomy of the muscle and muscle actions much better in comparison to reading it from just the book alone. So that's really why I'm going to go through this with you. Um, whether you are trained to become a personal trainer or whether you already are one, or this is just for your own knowledge, it's really crucial to really understand what's happening inside those muscles and the muscle fibres so you actually understand what you're training and, and why we train in that way. Um, so before you, whilst, whilst, once I've gone through all this, uh, make sure you're relating this when you actually go into the gym and start using your muscles because it'll uh, give a deeper understanding as well. So I want to get right into the thick of it to start off with. So basically the muscle is just not one great big contractile unit that we uh, would often think of. We often think of, okay, that's the bicep, it must just contract in one bulk. But it doesn't. It basically is microscopic contractile units all built up together. So our actual smallest part of it is called actin and myosin, and they make up a sarcomere. So if you can see my wonderful drawing, my drawings aren't great, and I'll apologise at once for all of my drawings. Um, this part here is the myosin. It's a thicker filament, so it's a little bit thicker protein filament. Um, on my drawing, it looks a bit like a centipede with golf club legs sticking out the side of it. Um, it's not far different from that in reality. And then you've got a thin red line, which is our actin. Basically, these two work together, and this is actually where contraction happens in our muscle. So, um, ATP, which you would have heard of in terms of an, a chemical used as part of our energy currency, sits on these little golf club heads. And then the production of energy allows us to have draw actin and myosin closer together. So these little golf club heads latch hold of the actin and then in a kind of like um, tug of war kind of scenario, it pulls it towards itself. So basically these two start to concertina together. In reality, they kind of twist as they do that, but imagine these two driving together. So this is a tiny microscopic sarcomere, the two together, and it's gradually um, being pulled inwards. As they close towards each other, that's a concentric contraction phase, and as they lengthen away, that's your eccentric phase. So for instance, if I do a bicep curl, that's the concentric phase. All these little uh, sarcomeres are coming closer together. And then the eccentric phases, I'm lowering the weight back down to the earth. That's where these little contractile properties go apart from each other. And it's nice, gradual and controlled. So, the red bit's actin. The green bit's myosin. Remember, the thicker bit is the myosin. Then you've got, this is a sarcomere. Okay, so... You, Treat that block as a sarcomere. These blocks then stack end on end. And obviously within these blocks, you've got to bear with me on my, on my drawing, remember. Within each of these blocks, you've obviously got your actin and your myosin filaments within those. So if one is contracting, all of these are contracting. So now we don't just rely on one actin and myosin doing its job, we're relying on all of these to do their job. So if one concertinas, all of them concertina. And these line up down the muscle fibre. So these line up down this way. So if you think of the line of fibre on every muscle, they've kind of got like a striated stripe to them. And that's given to it by its muscle fibre. And a muscle fibre is a collection, so a long line of these little sarcomeres. Okay, so as these contract, you can see that that would get smaller. As they concertina together, that's con concentric phase, and then eccentric, they would lengthen back out. So that's our muscle fibre. But in order to keep these all together, we've got a nice connective tissue that goes around the outside of that muscle fibre. We're going to call that, that connective tissue 
endomycium. All you need to think about for now in relation to that, if you find it hard to remember, is it's the end of the line. Okay, it's the last part, it's the smallest part. The mycium uh, part basically means a covering of muscle. So you've got muscle fibre um, is covered in endomycium. It's just a connective tissue there to hold it all together. Now, we stack these end on end now. So we've got the muscle fibre reaching downwards. Then these will end on end will build up. And we stack them all up together. Let me get a good colour on here. So, oh, they're nice. Ooh, you've got very much drawing. Okay. So these are all my muscle fibres in here. So, and the reason I've drawn them in a green circle is that that's the same as the endomycium around the outside. So I hope you are still following along. So these, each one of these is a muscle fibre. This collection of muscle fibres is called a fascicle. Or multiple ones of them, it's called fasciculi. Um, whatever works best for you, but fascicle. This blue bit around the outside is another bunch of connective tissue. So similar to the endomycium, but this is basically another lot of connective tissue that's holding all those muscle fibres together, calling it a fascicle. This is called a perimycium. It's a bit silly, but I remember this as in, if you go to Nando's, you always have your piri piri in the middle of your sandwich not on the outside. So this is our middle layer of connective tissue. Then from here we move on, it gets bigger and bigger. So this is our smallest, mi most microscopic. We're getting bigger and we're gradually zooming out of that muscle. So you're starting to take shape. This is probably a different take on it than what you've seen before, um, but I hope you're still following along nicely. So for this one, Blue pen. We've now got a collection of fascicles and a collection of these fascicles all built up with paramycin around the outside is now called the muscle body. So the body of the muscle. And that body of the muscle is then surrounded, surprise surprise, in another set of connective tissue. And this connective tissue is called epimycium. The way I remember epimycium is that's the epic bit, that's the outside layer, so epic. <laughs> okay, so you've got endomycium, paramycium, epimycium, and they're going to make up your connective tissues that separate each of the bundles of fibres, bundles of fascias, and obviously you've got the muscle body itself. Now this epimycium is the very outside layer of all of the muscles. So this is the one of the fascia that gets really tight and actually we are targeting when we do things like foam rollering or we go for a massage. Very hard to get into these connective, connective tissues, but we're actually looking to really release tension here when we're doing things like foam rollering, SMR or go for a sports massage. So this is where the tendon connects to. So this is my tendon, and then that tendon, as you well know, attaches to bone. So tendon attaches this muscle all the way to the bone, which allows us to move it. So without that bone there, we wouldn't have enough leverage to actually allow any uh, directed forceful movement. So this is the main part of it. Hopefully this helps you understand this side of it a little bit more, but we are not quite done yet. Um, and the main thing for this is about muscle contraction. So the anatomy of the muscle itself, I think fairly straightforward once you've learned all the different stages. Um, I even know a learner that made up their own song to help them do this. So if that's your style, then definitely have a go and share it if you can, because I'm sure others will, will benefit from that too. Um, the thing I really want to go through is how we actually make action with that. So uh, where would you think that the nerve would attach to in order to tell us to activate. We get a mixed response with this one, so you wouldn't be alone if you thought it was somewhere other than the correct answer. The actual answer is muscle fibre. 
So here we have our motor nerve attaching. Believe it or not, this is a motor nerve. Okay. So my motor nerve attaches to the muscle fibre. It doesn't attach to the whole muscle body, so it's not a case of all of my bicep must contract. And it doesn't attach into the actinomyosin, it attaches to a muscle fibre. So you can either innovate all of your muscle fibre, or none of it. All or none. But, it doesn't stop there. It can make it a little bit more complex as well, which is just understanding it in deeper. This isn't an ice cream cone, this is the central nervous system. So we've got the brain at the top, and you've got the spinal cord coming down. As you well know, if you ever have any reactions, your sensory neuron feeds into your central nervous system. So I've got my sensory neuron here, my sensory nerve. That's picking up stimulus from wherever. So, for instance, if I've got a flame and I put my hand on there, that's going to pick up a sensation and say, it's too hot. Okay? That sends it across the sensory nerve, gets the central nervous system, and at that point, it registers it and interprets it and causes a motor nerve to send the signal back to the relevant muscles so they can contract and move your hand away from the flame. Simple in principle. Okay, so then we go oh, okay, sorry. So then we go down to the motor nerve. So this motor nerve is causing that reaction in the muscle fibre. So that's the level we're talking about. Have you heard of a motor unit before? If you have, fab. The actual proper definition of a motor unit is the motor nerve, so this part, and all of the muscle fibres that it innervates. So I'll say it one more time. It's the motor nerve and all of the muscle fibres that it innervates. Now that isn't regular, so um, in some motor units there will be just a few motor nerve, uh, sorry, just a few muscle fibres being recruited. In some there will be tons, okay, there will be lots. But really what we're looking at and the difference of that is the need for power in that motor unit. So let's take the quads for example. The quads are notoriously there for power, strength, they usually have a lot of lifting to do as part of their contraction properties, but you don't need many options. All they've got to do is extend the leg, that's all they've got to do. So as a, as a way of um, doing that, your motor nerve in that case would attach to many more muscle fibres, so that when it's told to activate, it's actually activating lots of fibres at the same point, so it can get a really strong contraction. That in comparison to, say, in the hand, whereby we don't necessarily need lots of force, but we need lots of different options, so it's really complex movement. We'd want more motor nerves, each with less muscle fibres attached to it. So I hope that makes sense to you. Now, we don't recruit all of our motor units at any one point. So if you've ever been on a leg press, for instance, or any machine, you can go with any machine, any exercise, but let's go with leg press as our example. So you're sat on the leg press and you're ready to go, um, and you look at the weight, and you go, okay, that, that's 100 kilos, I can manage that. Or that's 60 kilos, I can manage that. Your body is registering and telling you how many motor units it wants to recruit so that you can lift that safely if you don't gauge that right, if your central nervous system doesn't gauge that right, then essentially you'll get injured or you just won't be able to lift it or you'll lift it too much, okay? So if you've ever picked up a box or a child thinking it would be really light and actually it was really heavy, you kind of get to that point and you're stuck um, and you can't lift it. As soon as you recalibrate and actually work out in your brain how heavy it is, you can pick it up fine. So that's a real good example of too few motor units being recruited in order to make the lift happen. Compare that to having too many motor units recruited, and it's like lifting up um, a box. Let's go with the box again. 
thinking it's really, really heavy, and it end up being really light, and you almost throw it right over your head. So what we're looking for in that case is that's too many motor units recruited, and as a result, you lift it very easily. Both of those can result in injury because it's not effective. So that's why we really rely on this nervous system to make sure that we're training effectively. And obviously in central nervous system, we're not aware of what's going on. Our body is very good at protecting itself. So when you're training, really you're training your nervous system. And as you're training your nervous system to get these contractions and to um, create movement in the body, you're creating it in certain actions and in different angles as well. But it's really important that you experiment with different loads because you're testing your ability to recognise the number of motor units needed. Um, so variety is really key when you're training your clients. Not only is variety really key, but it's important that people are gauged into the fact of where uh, this contraction is coming from. So I hope this is a, a anatomy overview really helps you A, with your revision, or B, when you're um, designing programmes for your clients. If you're designing programmes for your clients, really think about this and see how it adapts for you and see how it works for you. Really dial in and just imagine yourself moving on a cellular level rather than a mass muscle level. So uh, it would be really great to hear your feedback, so please pop a little comment below. Uh, once you've popped the comment below then um, or checked out the blog that this is linked to, then uh, please do let us know because we'd love to do more like this and I'd like to know what type of questions you have or what types of revision questions you get stuck on. So you can also select a strategy call um, on the button below. So on the button below, click the strategy call and you will be able to sign up for a free strategy study call and I will do that with you myself and we'll go through any of the questions that you mostly have. So have a lovely day. Take care.